Yes, two days in a row, juggling lessons, thousand fine points to you. Hi, Joy. Jim Harris. Do I know you, Jim? Did we go to separate schools together? I'm Matthew, alias fake name. Um, <clears throat> this apparently, this video that I stumbled upon, I can't believe I've never watched this before. Apparently it was um, a viral hit a long time ago. I don't even know the exact day of this message from Paul Washer. But I thought it was a great example of um, what a lot of Christian evangelicals think but are too scared to say. And But this guy, Paul Washer, wasn't scared at all. And uh, if you've noticed a lot of my interviews in the past, it's like you got to drag it out of these apologists and pastors to even say the word hell because they know it doesn't pull well, <laughs> um, the whole idea of hell and Christianity. But this guy, he doesn't hold anything back. And I, I was actually, I stumbled upon this guy. Um, this is BB International, Dr. Gene Kim. Does anybody know this guy? Um, I, I hadn't heard of him before, but he, he came up with a top 10 list of people you should delete, Christian ev evangelicals that you should delete from your subscriber list if you're a Christian. And uh, he skipped number 10 for some reason. Number nine was Jeff Durbin. I've critiqued him. Um, let's see. Number eight was James White. Well, they're actually nine and eight are together nowadays. Those two are in cahoots. Uh, number seven, and I've critiqued James White. Um, I'm not going to play anything this guy says. He talks, he basically has a vendetta. He doesn't like Calvinists, so most of these guys are Calvinists. Number seven was Matt Slick. I've talked to Matt. Um, yeah, he has a website, karm.org. Number six was Michael Hoodman, um, gotquestions.org. I'm sure if you've done any Christian research at all, you've stumbled upon that website, gotquestions.org. But he says, this guy says you should um, delete that guy, that not subscribe to him. Number five was Todd Friel. Oh, yeah. Todd Friel is a real entertainer. He's that, like, six foot six guy who was with the deep voice on, um, is it Wretched? Yeah. Uh, YouTube channel is Wretched. I've, uh, I think I've done one video on him. And let's see, who else does this guy not like? Number four was Ray Comfort, Living Waters. Ray is such a, a baby doll. He's like uh, he's like a little like a little puppy. How can you not like Ray Comfort? But I guess this, this guy doesn't like Ray Comfort for some reason. And um, <laughs> Paul Washer. So and this is I've heard of Paul Washer before, but um, this is why I'm doing this video today because he mentioned Paul Washer, saying that his theology was wrong or something like that. Number two, just for kicks, was John MacArthur. I've done, I think, a couple of videos on him. Uh, but notice the pattern. These are all, I think, except for maybe Ray Comfort, I think all these guys are Calvinists. I, and I don't know about Michael Hoodman. Um, but by the way, for those of you who are not into the lingo of Christianity, the reason why a lot of non-Calvinists don't like Calvinism because it really makes Christianity look terrible, horrible. It's basically a belief system that... God chooses to create people for his destruction, and that's his sovereign will. And, um, and basically, God chooses who goes to heaven, who, go, who goes to hell. And uh, if you're not in uh, his favorite uh, list, then tough luck. He, whatever God does, it's for his glory. And you're just weak-minded if you can't accept that. Um, let's see here. Of course, they accept the paradox of free will and God's sovereignty, God knowing what you're going to do before you do it, and you, you still are free to do it, because even if you don't do it, then God knew wrong. But the number one was John Piper. He covered it up here. Um, so he really doesn't like John Piper. Uh, I've done, I think, three or four videos on John Piper, at least two. And then number 10, I guess, where a lot of the smaller names like Cy, oh, poor Cy, R.C. Sproul, Steve Lawson. I don't think I've done anything on Steve Lawson or R.C. Sproul. Sproul. But, uh, yeah, I've done... I've talked to Cy. So, <laughs> it's it's kind of... Christians hate it when I 
bring stuff like this up because they're just showing the divisions among them. I'm showing the divisions among them. And if Christianity is going to survive, they have to, you know, be together. They have to, they have to kind of mend uh, their differences and, and say what's really important. That's the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the, for the forgiveness of sins so that one can inherit the kingdom of God, which is coming soon, even though it's been 2,000 years. And so, um, yeah, a lot of Christians don't like that. I bring up all these rivalries and disputes. The, the Calvinism, non-Calvinism one is a, is a pretty big, big dispute. I actually was thinking I should try to have a Calvinist come on and try to convert them to non-Calvinism using street epistemology. <laughs> Convert's a strong word, but help them doubt their Calvinism. And then vice versa, get a guy like Leighton Flowers on and try to, you know, sure he's come from Calvinist, but try to make him doubt his non-Calvinism and just show how um, Socratic questioning is useful for even that situation where, you know, I, I think both are just ridiculous. Um, but you can use Socratic questioning to, um, to help people critically examine their reasons for belief. Okay, so Paul Washer, let's, let's hear what he has to say. I've, I'm, I have this set at 2x. It's an hour-long sermon, so that brings it down to 30 minutes. I think he talks slow enough that I can get away with this. But if you're going to try to speed me up on the replay, it's not going to work because now it's if you put me at 2x and he's at 2x, now he's at 4x. But uh, if it's too fast, I'll slow it down. Oh, great. What is Paul? Oh, oh, he starts the message with um, reading a passage of Scripture, Matthew 7. And um, Matthew 7 is a very interesting message, uh, uh, Scripture. And it talks about, you know, don't judge people uh, Look in the mirror. Basically, it's the Michael Jackson song. Start with the man in the mirror. Uh, prayer and the golden rule, the, the narrow and the wide gates. Like this, for example. Oh, sorry, it's not uh, centered. But this really makes Christianity look bad. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are v few who find it. Now, this is why you'll find Christians who will try to weaken God's omniscience, and they use phrases like middle knowledge or um, Molinism, or they, they realize this makes God look like a schmuck if, if God saw all this coming, he, he saw that few will find life, eternal life. Can you imagine any of us making a system where uh, whatever, that, whatever it is, the system leads to mass destruction, that very, there's very few success with the system that we're implementing. In any human, and now for those Calvinists listening right now, I'm about to make a category error, so just hang on to your seat. But for any human being doing something like this, uh, setting up a system where it's most of it will fail and very few will, small percentage of success, that we would be terrible. Uh, we, uh, terrible designers, terrible planners, however, however you want to put it. But yet, this is what God did. So they got to sort of say, well, maybe God didn't really know what would happen. Um, maybe he just had to do it anyhow as part of his nature. He had to create, even though most people um, would find the, the wide gate to destruction. Now, destruction is a bit, is like a lot of Christians, they got to deal with this, that God created a system that leads most people to destruction. You know, again, God didn't have to create anything, did he? He has free will. Um, oh, oh, yeah, this, and this here, this passage in Matthew 7, verse, um, yeah, chapter 7, verse 21 if you're talking to a presuppositional Calvinist, this is the verse to bring up with them. I really think this is the one that they don't feel comfortable with. And again, sorry, it's cut off, but it basically says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Prophesy? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me you who practice lawlessness. 
So those presuppositional Calvinists who think that, oh, yeah, I'm elect. God chose me. Praise be to God. They have to look at this passage and say, there's people who have said the same thing and yet have gone to hell. How do you know you're not one of them? Side 10, Brugengate, how do you know you're not going to hell? Well, I have fruits, Doug. I've, I've, I, I live my life in repentance. And, and yeah, but so did these people. And, God, and Jesus said they, they're going to hell, that he didn't know them. How do you know you're not going to hell, Side 10, Brugengate? Are you sure you're going to heaven? Are you 100% sure? I mean, no, you, you've lived a pretty bad life in your thoughts, haven't you? Compared to God's will, God's obedience. Sorry, Sai, for picking on you, but um, I think you can take it, so that's why I'm doing it. But these are, the, these are the things I think you need to really... Maybe it's bad. It's just like, is this psychological bullying basically having someone question their, their etern eternal salvation? Maybe it is. Maybe it's psychological bullying, but, but it's a genuine question. How do you know you're not this person where Jesus says, uh, Lord, Lord, didn't we not do this? Didn't we do that? Um, and then Jesus says, I declare to them, I never knew you. Jeff Durbin, are you sure Jesus is going to say, I know Jeff Durbin? James White, are you sure that Jesus is going to say, I know you, Jeff White? James White? <laughs> Jeff White? <laughs> I melded them together. Oh, man. Hell is an invention of the church, Bishop John Sh Spung. Well, my open mind, um, it's definitely an invention of man, but I think, I think hell's needed. Uh, otherwise, it, look at the two biggest... Here's, here's a question for uh, people to ponder. What are the two biggest religions in the world? And Max B is thinking, well, of course, it's uh, Christianity and Islam. Why are they the two biggest? You think it's the marketing plan they have, the, the PR plan? It's, they have, I don't think it's a coincidence that Christianity and Islam are the biggest religions who have the worst concept of the afterlife in at least the majority of the sects of their religion. I stand here today. I'm not troubled in my heart about your self-esteem. I'm not troubled in my heart about whether or not you feel good about yourself, whether or not life is turning out like you want it to turn out, or whether or not your checkbook is balanced. There's only one thing that gave me a sleepless night. There's only one thing that troubled me all throughout the morning, and that is this. Within a hundred years, a great majority of people in this building will possibly be in hell. Yeah, and I think when I talk to apologists and pastors whether it's live on interview or via social, uh, Twitter, Facebook, this is what they're really thinking um, about the people they care about and about people like me that they're trying to evangelize. Is This is the real issue. And many who even profess Jesus Christ as Lord will spend an eternity in hell. You say, Pastor, how can you say such a thing? I can say such a thing because I don't do my Christian work in America. I spend most of my time preaching in South America, in Africa, and Eastern Europe. And I want you to know that when you take a look at American Christianity, it is based more upon a godless culture than it is upon the Word of God. And so many people are deceived, and so many youth are deceived, and so many adults are deceived into believing that because they prayed a prayer one time in their life, they're going to heaven. And thank you, Roger. I like what you do. Well, thank you so much. And then when they look around at others who profess to know Christ and see those people also just as worldly as the world, and they compare themselves by themselves, nothing troubles their heart. They think, well, I'm the same as most in my youth group. I watch... Craig's asking, isn't this all begging the question anyway because if all, all this is moot, if this stupid God doesn't even exist? Um, no, I don't think this is moot because I want, if someone's going to believe in Christianity, this version of it, I want them to own it and declare it from the rooftops. I want them to evangelize. I want every single Christian who's... I'll just say on the fence or lukewarm, to hear this message. I'm an atheist, and I'm begging them to listen to this message and then ask themselves, do you really believe it? Are you sure you believe this is true, that this is 
the God in your, in your mind that has set this up? Things I shouldn't watch on television and laugh about the very things that God hates. I wear clothing that is sensual. I talk like the world. I walk like the world. I love the music of the world. I love so much that's in the world. But bless God, I am a Christian. Why am I a Christian? I don't look any different than most of the other people in my church. Why am I a Christian? Because there was a time in my life when I prayed and asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. I want you to know that the greatest heresy in the American evangelical and Protestant church is that if you pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, he will definitely come in. You will not find that in any place in Scripture. You will not find that anywhere in Baptist history until about 50 years ago. Okay, so if you're a Christian listening and you've asked Jesus into your heart as, as your Lord and personal Savior, Paul Wash is telling you, oh, if you think that's going to get you to heaven, think again. And you, for people who've never been raised in this form of Christianity, I guarantee you that they have prayed the prayer of asking Jesus into their heart, not once, not twice, many times, for many of them. I'm not saying all. And because they, they doubt that they're saved. And even those... Christians who are listening right now who may be 50, 60, 70 years old, man, you're, you're agreeing with Paul Washer here, but that could be you. You're seven years old and you've loved God your whole life, but you could be going to hell because you're not really saved. That's a real possibility. I want messages like this to get out. I don't want to silence people like this. I want them to just know how disgusting a message like this really is. What you need to know is that salvation is by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. And faith alone in Jesus Christ is preceded and followed by repentance. A turning away from sin, a hatred for the things that God hates and a love for the things that God loves. A growing in holiness and a desire not to be like Britney Spears, not to be like the world, and not to be like the great majority of American Christians. Well, you can tell how old this video is because he's referencing Britney Spears. So this is at least like from the 90s, I guess. But to be like Jesus Christ. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. Yes, this is the line that ma made this uh, video viral. Um, let me back it up. I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you. I didn't I could hear a pin drop in there, I bet. Come here to get amens. I didn't come here to be applauded. I'm talking about you. People so many times come up to me and they say, oh, I'd love to follow you into Romania. I'd love to follow you into the Ukraine. I'd love to preach where you preached and planted churches in Peru in the jungle. And I tell them, no, you wouldn't. They say, yes, I would. I said, no, you wouldn't. Why? Because you'd be excommunicated from the church down there. What we need to see, I'm not trying to be hard for the sake of being hard. Do you realize how much love it takes to stand before 5,000 people and tell them that American Christianity is almost totally wrong? Do you know what it's going to cost me to never... American Christianity is almost totally wrong. This is spoken from a guy, like, I... This is not unique. I think a lot of Christians who have gone overseas and have seen the pain and suffering and the loyalty and the dedication to Jesus, um, when they come back to... Uh, North America. I have, I've had friends who've done this. It's a culture shock. It's like, why aren't you guys living for Jesus? What, what's going on here? There are people who are suffering and dying for their faith in other countries. And you're just, you're, you're laughing it about, up. You're, you're listening to Britney Spears. Like, what's wrong with you people? Ever be asked back again to something like this? To be unpopular? Do you know why you do it? You don't do it because you get paid well. You don't do it because men love you. You do it because you love men and because more than that you want to honor God. I want to tell you something. We are going to go into scripture and I want you to look at it as it really is. Stop comparing yourself with others who call themselves Christians, who compare themselves with others who call themselves Christians. Compare yourself to the scripture. When someone, a young person, comes to a pastor or a youth minister and says, I'm not sure whether or not I'm saved, the youth minister will usually throw out a cliche. Well, was there ever a time in your life when you prayed and asked Jesus to come to your heart? Well, yes. Were you sincere? Well, I don't know, but I think so. Well, you need to tell Satan to stop bothering you. Did you write it in the back of your book, the back of the Bible, like the evangelist told you when you got saved, to write down the date so that any time you doubted, you could point him to the Bible? What superstition has overcome our denomination? That's so ironic that he would say, what superstition? Like, and, and yet, from my perspective, most of what a guy like Paul Washer believes, if not all, is, is pure su superstition. Like, he believes that, that there's a spiritual warfare and he's calling that, well, um, writing the date of your salvation on the back of your Bible, that's a superstitious, like grabbing a, a rabbit's foot. But yet he believes that there's this spiritual warfare and that if he prays in the name of Jesus, the, the demons will go away. Why is one superstitious and not the other? You know what the Bible tells Christians to do? Examine yourself. Test yourself in light of Scripture to see if you are in the faith. 
Test yourself to see if you're Christian. You realize if I dismissed us right now and told everyone to go knock on every door in this city, do you know what we would find out? 99% of the people, at least in this city, believe themselves to be believers. If you go back to your hometown and knock on every door, because I went back to my hometown after I got saved and knocked on every door, and you know what I found out? Everyone in my town is a Christian. Yes, I've... <laughs> this brings back memories. Because the number one step in evangelism, especially in North America, is to give, convince the person you're talking to. So if you're a Christian who's an evangelist, who's spreading the good news of the gospel, your number one job is not actually to spread the gospel, is to convince them that they haven't heard it, or to convince them that they're not saved, or convince them they're not really a Christian. Um, because I think Paul Washer is exactly right. Most people you, that you knock on the doors and you ask, hey, are you a Christian? Have you, do you know the good, the good news? They'll say, yes, I'm a Christian. 85% of them do not go to church, and those who do go to church are not concerned about holiness, they're not concerned about serving, they're not concerned about being separate from the world, they're not concerned about the gospel being preached among the nations. But bless God, they're saved. Why are they saved? Because some evangelist who should have spent less time preaching and more time studying his Bible told them they were saved. And he did it so that he could brag about how many people came forward in his next revival. I love you! Uh, Raphael, how come I'm not getting notifications? Uh, YouTube is notoriously bad at sending no um, notifications. So follow me on my Facebook page, Pine Creek Doug on Facebook, or on Twitter, P1, Pine Creek, at Pine Creek, except instead of an I, it's a, the number one. And that is more consistent. Um, if you have Twitter open, you should uh, maybe you'll see it, maybe you won't. But if Facebook's probably the best. You'll get a notification that uh, um, that I'm live. And there are men here who love you. And I want to go into Scripture now, now that I've shocked you into life. I want you to listen to me. Listen to the Word of God and begin to ask yourself some questions. First of all. So if you came late, I love this sermon, and I think it should be preached more often, because what it really gets down to is that it, it, it creates doubt in one's eternal salvation. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. There is a narrow gate. And you know, historically, one of the reasons I'm a Southern Baptist is because the Southern Baptists have always been quick. When other denominations have failed to realize this, the Southern, Southern Baptists have always been quick to realize that there is one gate. There is one God. There is one mediator between God and man, and His name is Jesus Christ. It's not multiple choice. Not every road leads to Rome. As a denomination, we have always told people what Jesus told people. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So I praise God for that, that the only way any human being on this earth... I want you to listen to this. I praise God for that. What is he praising God for? That Jesus is the only way and that everyone who rejects Jesus Christ as Lord is doomed to hell. This is what Paul Washer believes. And he praises God that, um, what, 90% of this planet is doomed for hell? Is that... <laughs> He's, he's not directly saying that, but that's really what he's saying, that, that God set up a system that's so exclusive that you have a wide gate of destruction. He's praising God for that. And I think part of it is human psychology that, um, that when you believe something so, that's so rare, so difficult, being a Christian is not easy, I think, according to Paul Washer. It's not easy to be a Christian, to take up your cross, repent every day. Um, it... It's an, it's an exclusive club. It's special. Earth will ever be saved is through Jesus Christ. And that is all. Because you need to realize the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and you have no idea what that means. That we were born radically depraved and God-hating. That we would have never sought God, never come to God. We have rebelled against God, broken every law. It's not just an issue that you have sinned. The issue is you've never done anything but sin. So you're born God-hating. Your nature is God-hating. This is why um, I think Calvinists are more consistent, because the Bible does teach that, um, that there's nothing good in you. You're born in a sinful nature. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, um, and so without God's saving regenerational work, you, you're, you're not going to be saved. And for some strange reason, God has chosen to save um, very few people. The Bible says in the prophets that even our greatest works are like filthy rags before God. And because of that, you know what we deserve? The wrath of God. We deserve the wrath of God. We deserve to be punched. 
We deserve to be kicked. We deserve to be choked. Why? Because we were born in a, in a certain way. And our long past ancestors made a mistake. And, but we're so depraved, so bad. We deserve to be separated from God. But there's hope. There's good news. God pay, paved a way of redemption. The holy hatred of God. You say, now wait a minute. God doesn't hate anybody. God is love. No, my friend. You need to understand something. Jesus Christ taught, the prophets taught, the apostles taught this. That apart from the grace of God revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord, the only thing left for you is the wrath, the fierce anger of God. Yeah, I, this needs to be preached over and over and over again from every pulpit. <laughs> Let me rewind that. Um, and now, hear, hear me out. Calvinists, uh, pe the Paul Washer fans, they're cheering. But listen to what he's saying here. That apart from the grace of God revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord, the only thing left for you is the wrath, the fierce anger of God. Yeah, that... People say Jesus is love, God is love. But the only thing you deserve is not God's love. You deserve God's wrath, his destruction. You deserve to be punched and kicked and poked and cut from Yahweh because you are depraved. Because of your rebellion and your sin. When I speak in universities, they're always quick to point out, no, God cannot hate because God is love. And I tell you, God must hate because God is love. You see, I love children, therefore I hate abortion. If I love that which is holy, I must hate that which is unholy. God is a holy God. That's something that the Americans have forgotten. Many of the things that you love to do, God hates. Did you know that? Pray for revival. You're going to have a youth meeting. You want God to move. But before you go there, you watch programs on television that God absolutely despises. And then you wonder why the Holy Spirit hasn't fallen on a place and why you have to create false fire and false excitement. Because God's not in it. God is a holy God. And the only way you and I could ever be reconciled to a holy God is through the death of God's own Son when He hung on that tree. Now listen to me. If you're saved here tonight, you're not saved because the Romans and Jews rejected Jesus. You're not saved because they put a crown of thorns on His head. You're not saved because they ran a spear through His side. And you're not saved even because they nailed Him to a cross. Do you know why you're saved if you are saved? Because when Jesus Christ was hanging on that cross, He bore your sin, the sin of God's people, and all the fierce wrath of God that should fall upon you fell upon His only begotten Son. Someone had to pay that price. Someone had to die. Okay, but notice what he's saying here. Uh, you're only saved because God, Jesus Christ, bore your sin on that cross. But doesn't that apply to everyone? Didn't Jesus do that for everyone? But the Calvinists would say no. He only did that for those He chose, he, that He foreknew. It was God the Father who crushed His only begotten Son, according to Isaiah 53. It says it pleased Yahweh to crush him. People say the cross is a sign of how much man is worth. That's not true. The cross is a sign of how depraved we really are, that it took the death of God's own Son. The only thing that could save a people like us is the death of God's own Son under the wrath of His own Father paying the price. Rising again from the dead. Power Christianity is a religion where someone had to die. Powerful to save. This is the gospel of Jesus. Now what are you called upon to do? You say you go through the narrow gate. How do you do that? Jesus said the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. What must you do? In Mark, he tells us, repent and believe the gospel. He said, repent and believe the gospel, even though there is nothing within you that can do that, according to the Calvinist. Hey, Brother Paul, I so if you're, a non, if you're a Christian listening who's a non-Calvinist, like Leighton Flowers, uh, uh, you probably do this already, but you really need to pound the Calvinist on this, that... You're telling people to repent of their sins when they're, were, when they're born that way. And they can't, they can't know any differently because that's their nature. They can't do any differently because that's their nature. And yet you're, you're commanding them as a voice of God to do something that they cannot do. You need to pound this in with the, to the Calvinists. Uh, and they, the Calvinists realize that, that that's true, that that's right. Um, but they just say, well, God commanded us to do it, and we don't know who's saved and who isn't, so we don't have the mind of God, so we've got to act like they are elect and saved, and so therefore we just um, talk like this out of obedience. That's basically all the Calvinists can say. I got saved by praying and asking Jesus Christ into my heart, and I'm sure you did. 
But you weren't saved by a magic formula or some words you repeated after someone else. You were saved because you repented of your sin. Andrew Thelpos asks, uh, or says to Max B, uh, I wonder if there are any studies on fundamental Christianity's effect on mental health. That's a good question. Um, I, I do think that when you believe in spiritual warfare, demons and angels, I tell you, this, these are the types of questions I, I plead with you guys. If you're talking to uh, a Christian who you can tell that they view themselves as intelligent and well-educated, well-read, just focus in on spiritual warfare, demons, angels, uh, and how that affects their mental well-being. Um, their their fears of of for others to be possessed or oppressed by Satan. I, I tell you, they don't. They feel very uncomfortable talking about these things. But whenever you're exposed, when you're talking to Christians, don't talk about the Kalam <laughs> or the um, other philosophical arguments, talk about what's real in their lives. When they wake up in the morning, their quiet times, um, what they struggle with. And I tell you, they don't want to talk about these things. And you believed. And not only did you do that in the past, you continue to do it even until now. Because when Jesus, a proper translation... By the way, they don't want to talk about these things, but they should. Their own scriptures kind of... It's not direct, but they should be authentic and real with you. And First Peter three fifteen, if you ask them, how do they deal um, with, you know, certain lustful thoughts? Like, yeah, talk to like if if I Jeff Durbin, James White, if you ever if you ever um, talk to me uh, in an interview, be prepared. I'm going to ask you questions like this, questions you do not want to talk about publicly. I'm going to ask you about your browser history. When's the last time? <laughs> I'm wondering if how real you guys are willing to be or how much of a facade you have to keep. Like, and these are the things that a lot of Christians listening right now will say, yeah, Doug, you should be able to ask this of Christians, how they deal with that, their struggles, how they overcome it. Um, Christians should be the first one to admit their weaknesses because they were nothing before they met Christ, before they were saved. But yet they struggle so hard with that. They, they don't want to admit that th their weaknesses in, the, in these areas. And of that verse he gave is this, the kingdom of God has come, the time is fulfilled. Now spend the rest of your life repenting of your sins and believing in me. Conversion is not like a flu shot. Oh, I did that. I repented. I believe. The question is, my friend, are you continuing to repent of sin? Are you continuing? Yeah, and this is what makes Christianity a struggle. Because not only do you have to repent of your sin, but what Paul Washer is saying is if you want to be confident that you are saved and you're not going to hell, you've got to continually repent of your sin. I feel like calling people out here. <laughs> Christian apologists. Like, do I do that? I, I'm not going to name specific names, but specific apologists and pastors that I've talked to. Do you continually, like how often do you actually repent of certain lustful thoughts? Is it daily? Weekly? Monthly? Do you feel that you've conquered these thoughts? Or do you find yourself constantly, over and over, asking for forgiveness? Now, let me propose something to you. If the Holy Spirit's real, if the Holy Spirit is actually a helper, wouldn't you think this wouldn't happen, that you wouldn't constantly have to ask for forgiveness for your lustful thoughts? Mr. Apologist, Mr. Pastor. I am so confident. <laughs> I am so confident that pastors and apologists and Christians struggle with this because they're human. And I think evolution has made us 
certain in a certain way we have evolved in a certain way to have these thoughts for a reason for reproduction but in the christian realm no 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 these thoughts are bad unless they're in the confines of marriage and so forth but wouldn't it make sense that if the holy spirit was real you wouldn't struggle so much with these things and maybe if evolution is true that maybe you would and I'm not even saying it's a struggle, it's just the re a reality. So what is the, what, what, where does the evidence point to? To believe, because he who began a good work in you will finish it. He will finish it. Now we as Southern Baptists preach that you're supposed to go through that own one and only gate, which is Jesus Christ. But we as Southern Baptists have forgot something. And I want youth ministers and pastors and everyone to listen to me. Parents, we have forgot a very important teaching in the gospel. It says that not only the gate is narrow, it says the path is narrow. What we basically do is lead someone to Christ, lead someone in a prayer, and then they spend the rest of their life living just like the world. And if you deny me on this, I can bring the statistics to prove you wrong. Gallup poll, Barnum polls, every kind of poll you can possibly look at, when it questions the morality of the church in America against the morality of those who claim to be lost in America, the polls find no difference. The polls find no difference. Let this message be shouted from the rooftops that those who confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior, who write it on the back of their Bibles the date when they became a Christian, the polls show, according to Paul Washer, that when it comes to morality, there's no difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. But Doug, Doug, these are not true Christians. These are like, these are fakes. That's right. So many fake Christians out there, right? Maybe you're one of them. Are you sure you're going to heaven? Now that is statistics. It has nothing to do with religious interpretation. Those are statistics. Book after book is being churned out by theologian and philosopher and, and sociologist alike. What has happened to the church? We find out that abortion in the church is just as prevalent as outside the, in the world. We find that divorce is just as prevalent. We find that immorality. You know as well as I do there are youth here right now who are practicing immorality and yet worshiping God in the same breath. You know there are youth here that are doing drugs and yet coming to youth group. You know watching and doing things that are... Yeah, like can you imagine being a young person in this audience and, you know, just last week you tried weed for the first time or... You had sex for the first time just the previous week. And just the guilt you're feeling. Oh, man, you need Jesus at this point because of this guilt. You just want to be free from this burden. And maybe you weren't quite ready for sex. And maybe you weren't quite ready to experiment with drugs. And, and you just you had bad consequences or whatever. And you just feel the guilt is just building and you realize that if you keep this up, you're going to have et uh, an eternal destination called hell. This is why Christianity is the largest religion on the planet, because of this technique. They're not appropriate for a Christian, and yet they're coming to the youth group, believe themselves satisfied, believe themselves safe, and no one is saying anything except this. They're carnal Christians. They're really Christians. They're just carnal. That was a doctrine that started in a Baptist seminary that is not a Southern Baptist seminary several decades ago. It is not biblical and it is not historical. My dear friend, there is no such thing as a carnal Christian. You say, no, wait a minute, Brother Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, are ye not carnal? Paul said that. No, that's what Paul said. You need to read the whole book to find out what he meant. You see, one of our problems... <laughs> that's what Paul said, but that's not what he meant. I know what Paul meant. Forget what he says. I know what he meant. Oh, my goodness. Um... Yeah, I, I'm sure if Paul Washer was here sitting with me here right now, he would um, maybe regret saying that. But you notice um, when Christians talk about the Old Testament, they'll get a, you'll hear a line similar to what Paul Washer just said. Well, this is what the Old Testament says, that God commanded, you know, all those heinous things in the Old Testament. But that's not really what God meant or said or did. It's not really what represents the God I know. Problems, youth. Listen to me. Most of our Christianity is based on cliches that we read on the back of Christian teaching. <laughs> A thousand fine points to Brandon Maxwell. My browser history is Pine Creek, Pine Creek, Pine Creek. <laughs> oh yeah, I see what you did there. Shirts. Most of our Christianity comes from songwriters, and not the Bible. Most of what we believe to be true is dictated to us by our culture, and not by the Bible. The Bible never teaches that a person can be a genuine Christian and live in continuous carnality and wickedness and sin all the days of their life. But the Bible teaches that the genuine Christian has been given a new nature. 
The genuine Christian has a father who loves them and disciplines them and watches over them and cares for them. The genuine uh, Christian has been given a new nature, but yet he admitted earlier that uh, polls show that there's no difference in morality between Christians and non-Christians. But of course, those are not the real Christians. My heart is breaking because you know as well as I do, young people, let's not be hypocrites about it, let's not hide it. There are so many, you know them. You might be one of them, or you at least know that they're in your youth group. They come to youth group, they do all this stuff, but in their heart, they're as wicked as wicked can be. There's no difference, there's no light. Everything that the world does, they do, and it's appropriate, it's okay. My friend, that's not Christianity. They're not in danger of losing their reward, they're in danger of hell. They know not God. What do we teach? When was the last time you heard someone say, there's not only a narrow gate into heaven, but a narrow way? Jesus indicates that one of the principal signs of being a genuine Christian... So if you're a Christian listening, you believe in a God, if you agree with Paul Washer here, you believe in a God who set up a system where very, very, very few people will enter heaven, and most people will go a place, a very bad place, called hell, which is a place. Think of it as, I'm sure this video is going to be demonetized now, but, but think of the God you worship and serve. This is the way I view Paul Washer's Christianity. The God you worship and serve looks at a baby that's born as sinful, and that as it grows up it, and it becomes accountable for its actions, it has to repent. And if it doesn't, that human being needs to be punched, kicked, tortured for eternity for not repenting continually. Remember Paul Washer said continually. You just don't repent once. Over and over you got to repent because... You deserve God's wrath. Jesus doesn't love everyone. He loves only the ones he saved. Christian, is that you walk in the narrow way. You know what the sign for being a genuine Christian is in America is? You prayed a prayer one time. Isn't that amazing? What are Joe De Palato is asking, does anyone here in the live stream chat agree with Paul Washer? <laughs> I, wanna, I don't know how many Christians are here right now. My guess is maybe six um, or eight. I don't know, 10%. Um, I think, Joe, I could be wrong about this, but I think the majority of Christian pastors and apologists that I've talked to on my channel, they're not, they won't agree with everything Paul Washer says, but a lot of it they believe, especially the narrow gate, narrow path, wide destruction stuff. No, they, and repentance, a lot of that stuff, that, and hell, heaven, yeah, they believe it, but they won't say it like this. Are you asked, if you doubt your salvation, did you pray a prayer one time? What does scripture teach? Examine yourselves, test yourselves in the light of scripture to see if you're in the faith, because a Christian will be different. Now, I'm, am I saying that Christian is without sin? No, because in First John we learn that Christians do sin, and if any man does not acknowledge his sin, he knows not God. He's not walking in the light. So what is the difference? What am I really getting at? What am I getting at is this. If you are genuinely a born-again Christian, a child of God, you will walk in the way of righteousness as a style of life. And if You will walk in the way of righteousness. Okay, Christians listening, have you walked in the way of righteousness today? Really? Have you? How about last week, last month? Have you really walked in the way of righteousness? Because I'm not talking about just... Be nice. I'm talking about God's righteousness. Have you really walked? If you're a true Christian, if you really love Jesus, you're going to obey him. Those who love Jesus obey his commands. Do you really love Jesus or do you just say you do? Do you really obey or do you just say you do or hope you do? Do you really walk in repentance or do you just say you do? Are you sure you're saved? If you step off that path of righteousness, the Father will come for you. He will discipline you. He will put you back on that path. But if you profess to have gone through the narrow gate and yet you live in the broad way, just like all the other people in your high school, just like all the other people who are carnal and wicked, the Bible wants you to know that you should be terribly, terribly afraid. <laughs> you, know? you should be terribly, terribly afraid. Christianity, according to Paul Washer, is a religion where you should be, if you don't do certain things, you should be terribly 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 afraid you know what i think there are way more christians who agree with this than they let on 
they agree with this. No, not God. I fear men who have spent most of their life telling other men that they are saved. I fear you if you've done that. You don't tell men they are saved. You tell men how to be saved. God tells them they are saved. What we have forgotten to believe is that salvation is a supernatural work of God. And those who have genuinely been converted, regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be a new creature. The Bible says if any man be yeah, in Christ, he is a new creature. So we find out here in Scripture, there is a narrow gate and a narrow way. We go into 16, go into verse 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. One of the things you need to realize is this. Something a wise man told me a long time ago. He said, Paul... Yeah, Cosmic Apostate says, listen to Washington, listen to any mega church service, and you will witness two different religions. I agree with that. Um, the problem is, like, it, it, the, they're mega churches for a reason because they help people cope with the problems of life, they make people feel good. What Paul Wash is doing right now is not making people feel good. He's making people doubt their eternal destiny, and he's making people feel guilty. He's making people just feel terrible for who they are, what they've done. But he believes that he's doing this biblically. And he does have a lot of Bible verses to support what he's saying. Your best friend is the one who tells you the most truth. In America, we have become so thin-skinned that no one can rebuke us. No one can tell us we are wrong. And ministers and leaders alike have bought into this lie. We do not want to offend. We want to be seeker friendly. What you need to realize is there is only one seeker and his name is God. And if you want to be friendly to somebody in your church, you need to be friendly. We want to be seeker friendly. This really resonates with me because when I was a Christian in Canada, uh, between the ages of, let's say, it was probably between 18 and 22, I went to a seeker sensitive type church called, um, it was based on the Willow Creek model. And the whole goal was to get people who were unchurched into the church and they did things differently. It was like hip music and great dramas and great practical messages and so forth and it worked um but it wasn't really biblical it wasn't you couldn't really call it a church of believers then friendly to god and you need to be more concerned for the glory of god than you are the attitudes of men but another thing you need to realize raphael is bringing up an interesting verse jeremiah twenty three thirty nine. therefore behold i even i will utterly deceive you and i will forsake you in the city that i gave you in your fathers and cast you out of my presence yeah, there, that's the first that really s sounds like it's saying, saying that God deceives people for his glory. But that's, yeah, that can't be what it means, right? Brother John, uh, remember my health thought experiment? If you had the foreknowledge of having seven children and knew six would go to hell, would you still have those children? Yes, that's a great thought experiment. Um, that's another one you should ask um, Christians. Because if Paul Washer, I don't know how many kids he has. Someone can look that up. <laughs> oh my Paul Washer if you ever hear this you're invited on my show and I think one of my first questions would be the one uh, Brother John's uh, saying I think you have a lot of children how many of those do you think are going to go to heaven when they die if wide is the gate to destruction is the person who loves you most will tell you the most truth one of the greatest distinguishing marks of a false prophet is that he will always tell you what you want to hear. He will never rain on your parade. He will get you clapping. He will get you jumping. He will make you dizzy. He will keep you entertained. And he will present a Christianity to you that will make your church look like a six flags over Jesus. And keep you so entertained, you are never addressed with great issues such as these. Is God working in my life? Am I growing in holiness? Have I truly been born again? Listen to me. If everyone in this town believes themselves saved, and we know that's not true by Scripture because the Bible says that few will enter in, how do you know that you're saved? How do you truly yes. know that you are saved? How do you know? Because someone told you? Because you prayed a prayer? Because you believed? Well, let me ask you a question. How do you know you believe? Because everybody says they believe. How do you know you're not like them? Do you know how the Bible teaches you that... This sure sounds workspace to me. Like, everybody can believe. Even Satan believes in God. Um, but it has to do with repentance, right? Something you do, you have to repent. What does repentance mean? It means turning away. Turning is a verb. It's, some, it's an action. See, the, the whole idea of Christianity is, is just full of frictions. It's like it's, it's through grace, not that any man should boast. But yet, 
you got to repent. You got to turn. You got to do something. You got to you got to keep going and not only repent once, but again and again and again and take captive and and if you live a certain way, you're not going to inherit the, it's like they they have all these tensions going on at the same time and yet it's no wonder. I I I'm actually shocked that more Christians don't have nervous breakdowns. You know you are saved. Do you know how Baptist theology up until about 50 years ago would have told you how you know you have been saved? You know. Actually, most Christians don't even think about this stuff, so that's probably how they keep saying. You have been saved because your life is in a process of being changed, and your style of life is one of walking in the paths of God's truth. And when you step off those paths in disobedience, as we all do, God comes for you and puts you back on the path. One of the greatest evidences that you have truly... God comes for you and puts you back on the path if you go off the path. So why do you even need to repent then? If, if it's God who puts you back on the right path, why do you even have to do anything? See, this is the non-Calvinists are just cheering for me right now and saying, yeah, Doug, this is why Calvinism is terrible and why it doesn't work. Because it takes all the responsibility off the, off the person and puts it on God. And we can't have that because then God looks like a schmuck. you have been born again is that God will not let you talk as your flesh might want to talk. God will not let you dress as the sensual world and the sensual church allows you to dress. God will not allow you to act like the world, smell like the world, speak like the world, listen to the things that the world listens to. God will make a difference in your life. God will make a difference in your life. Okay, let's say that's true. Shouldn't we be able to see that difference? And again, I'm going to pick on uh, Christian men uh, between the ages of 18 and 22 when normally their testosterone levels are through the roof at that age. Do you think the Holy Spirit really helps you with your lustful thoughts, Christian men? Isn't the Holy Spirit supposed to help you and guide you, lead you to all truth? Do you think it works? Aren't you tired Christian men between the ages of 18 and 22 who go to church regularly, aren't you tired of just seeing that really lovely lady in the front pew and having to feel so guilty about the thoughts you have? Aren't you tired of that yet? Aren't you tired of asking for forgiveness over and over and over again? You're not, you're not tired of that? Is, it, is, it, is your fear of your eternal life just so overwhelming that you just have to keep on asking for forgiveness and hoping that you do better the next time? Is that what's really going on? He says here, as we go on, verse 17, so every, or let's go to 16, you will know them by their fruit. How will you know a false prophet in the wider application here in all of Scripture? How will you know if someone is a genuine Christian? By their fruit. By their fruit, my dear friend. Look at your life. Look at the way you walk. Look at the way you talk. Look at the passions of your heart. By their fruit, you should know them. But we got a problem here, though. Isn't casting out demons a type of fruit? Isn't performing miracles in the name of Jesus to, like, heal people and help people? Isn't that a fruit? But yet Jesus said, I would declare to them, I never knew you. So... Pastor Washer, if by their fruits you should know them, and if some fruits people can do and they still end up in hell, what good are fruits? And are you, is there any Christian out there who's going to say to me that they don't know a non-Christian? I'm not talking about atheists, but just anyone who's not a Christian, that they look at their life and they see more fruit in that non-Christian's life than their own? And you have the audacity to say you're going to heaven and they're not? Hmm. This is so much fun. Bart, is Jesus in there somewhere? Or is he just some accessory that you add on to your life? Is he just something you do on Wednesday or Sunday? Is he something that you give a mental assent to? Is he an accessory or is he the very center of your life? And what is the fruit that you're bearing? Do you look like the world, act like the world? Do you have and experience the same joys that the world experiences? Can you love sin and relish it? Yeah, this is why there's Amish people. This is why there's Mennonites who look differently and act differently than the world. This is why there's churches without electricity. Did you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I come from a Mennonite background. I, I know Mennonites. I've been, I know Hutterites. A lot of you don't even know who Hutterites are. They, they live in communal groups in colonies. 
It's basically a form of Christian socialism. It's a version of Christian communism with a God. Um, I know very few Amish. I don't think I know any Amish, but I know um, that they're similar in, in that community aspect. They have separated themselves from the world. They don't have electricity in a lot of cases. They don't do certain things because I don't see you doing that, Paul Washer. Why aren't you living in a, com a commune and giving everything you own and share it like the Hutterites do? Shouldn't you separate yourself from the world? This is... This is craziness. Can you love rebellion and relish it? Then you know not God. You will know them by their fruit. God has the power to change them. Let's imagine for a moment Jesus teaching this passage. And you're sitting out there listening. And he looks at you. He says, thistles, thistles. Um, do you find thistles on, on fig trees? And you respond, of course not, Jesus. I mean, you're not an agriculturalist. You're not a farmer. I mean, you're a carpenter. But I mean, everybody knows Jesus. You don't find thorns on fig trees. Well, well, then let me ask you another question. Do you find figs, good fruit, on thorn trees? Why, no, Jesus, that's absolutely ludicrous. I mean, you're never going to find thorns on a fig tree, and you're not going to find figs on a thorn tree. Jesus, to say that that could be possible, anyone who tells you that, Jesus, you can mark it down. There yeah, Chen saying Ravi Zacharias is better than Paul Washer for enthusiasm. Um, I'm not so sure about that. I used to really like Ravi Zacharias, but he gets really tiresome fast because it, he just recites poem after poem or <laughs> quote after quote. If you, if you listen to him try to give an answer to a question, it's just, it's, I would never ask a question of Ravi Zacharias that was not, I, it would have to be either true or false, or lean true, lean false, multiple choice. I would beg him not to quote anybody else, not to recite a poem, just answer the question. Like, Ravi Zacharias is really um, disturbing to me. <laughs> either crazy or they're a liar. And then Jesus responds to you, well then. Those who call themselves my disciples and bear bad fruit, would not it be the same to say that they were either lying or out of their mind to make such a statement? Let me take it a little further. Let's imagine that I show up late and I run up here on the platform. And, and the, every, all the leaders are angry with me. I said, Brother Paul, don't you appreciate the fact you're giving the opportunity to speak here and you come late? And I said, Brothers, you have to forgive me. Well, why? Well, I was out here on the highway and I was driving and I had a flat tire and then I got out to change the tire and when I was changing the tire, the lug nut fell off and I wasn't paying attention that I was on the highway and I ran out and I grabbed the lug nut and as soon as I picked it up in the middle of the highway, I stood up and there was a 30 ton logging truck going 120 miles an hour about 10 yards in front of me and it ran me over and that's why I'm late. Now, there would only be two logical, I know no one studies logic anymore, but there would only be two <laughs> logical conclusions. One, I'm a liar. Or two, I'm a madman. You would say, Brother Paul, it's absolutely absurd. It is impossible, Brother Paul, to have an encounter with something as large as a logging truck and not be changed. And then my question would be to you, what is larger, a logging truck or God? How is it that so many people today profess to have had an encounter with Jesus Christ and yet they are not permanently changed? There's another option because it's not real. They could, they could be honest in the sense that they truly believe that they've had an experience of God. But this experience, they could be mistaken. Let me give you a few things to think about. I, I've said this so many times as with much force as I can. Um, but for Christians listening who've ha who can think back of a personal experience of Jesus, of God, and I think most of them can tell you of a personal experience. I, I'm here to say that your attribution, what you think actually happened there, is probably wrong. It's plausibly wrong. It's most likely wrong. It's possibly right, but it's plausibly most likely wrong. And why do I say that? Because of the thousands, billions um, of personal experiences of deities that lead to con contradictory conclusions. Your personal experience, I'm sorry to say, doesn't mean much. Hey, thank you, Ronald, uh, for the $10 donation. Poof him at the end, please. Okay, I'll do that. You know I'm telling you the truth. How many times do you go and rededicate your life over and over ah, yes. and over? I was just saying this. How many times do youth groups go to things like this and get fired up and go back to the... See, see you can tell he's just, he's tired of that just as much as, as I am. Um, like it's, there's so many Christians who 
I, and I, I, I can almost guarantee it that they've gone, they go through this exact same thing and, but they're just too timid to admit it, that they just, they doubt that they're Christian and then they have to just keep asking God to, to help them and enter their life and church and it lasts about a week and a half and yet oh it was a great move of God no it wasn't if it doesn't last it wasn't a great move of God it was emotion it was so many things but it wasn't a great move of God has God worked in your life is God working in your life you will know them by their fruit you will know but even if they cast out demons and even if they perform miracles that fruit is not good enough according to Jesus because Jesus said to those people I never knew you so what kind of fruit do you need to do? Um, just not lie for a week? Uh, not have sex outside of marriage for a month? Um, and you can lapse and make a mistake once, and then, but you're on the solid path for another month. How, when you, <laughs> those who live an adulterous, uh, adulterous life will, shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven, um, what defines live? Like how many times can you err before you're not... Um, Christian enough. Hold them by the fruit. Now we go on. Verse 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruit. Look at this. You need to understand something about Hebrew literature. When you and I want to emphasize something, do you know what we do? We raise our voice. If we're writing, we put it in bold letters or we capitalize it. But to a Jew, it's different. When he wants to emphasize something, he repeats it and he repeats it. That's why you find Hebrew parallelisms in the book of Proverbs. The wicked shall not live in the land. The wicked shall be destroyed. He's saying the same thing, just in a different way to give greater emphasis. That's what Jesus is doing over and over again here. You will know them by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. You will know them by the path that they walk in. You will know them by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. And he says, anyone who does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What is he talking about? My dear friend, he is talking about the judgment of Almighty God that will one day fall upon the world. That will one day fall, possibly. Carrots and sticks, here it is. Upon you. Oh, dear friend, I cannot look into your heart. I am so easily deceived by my own heart. But there is one who is... I am so easily deceived by my own heart. Well then, Paul Washer, how in the world do you know you're even saved? It's not deceived. There is one who is not deceived, and he's not deceived by a contemporary Christian culture. He knows. You will know them by their fruit. Then he goes on. He says this. Verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Do you know what your profession of faith in Jesus Christ is worth? Absolutely nothing. Uh, Patrick Kuning, Kuning saying, Casting out demons and healing are not called fruit in the Bible. Haven't you heard of the fruit of the Spirit? Yeah, I've heard of the fruit of the Spirit. Um... But do you think this is what Paul Washer is saying, that when he says fruits, he's talking about a specific list? Where is that found? Let's see if I can find it. You bring up a good point, Paul. So I'm, or Patrick, I'm going um, to look up that list, fruits of the Spirit. I think the way Paul Washer is using the word fruit as, um, as a consistent repentance, a consistent taking up the cross, following Jesus. Okay. Galatians, right? Galatians 5. I think it's Galatians 5. Here we go. Found it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is, no, there is no law. Now those who belong to Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, have crucified the flesh and, and with his passions and desires. Okay. Um, now, could a non-Christian live a life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Now, according to this, according to Christianity, the answer is no. You cannot have true love, true joy, true peace, true patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and not be a believer. So then my question for you, Patrick, um, let's say Paul is talking about, Paul Washer is talking about these types of fruits. I bet you, I bet you if people didn't know me, I bet you they could see me as just as loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, 
depending on how you define faithful, I guess, as a Christian. And yet, does that mean I'm going to heaven? Does that mean I'm saved? Of course not. Not according to Christian doctrine. You will know them by their fruits, yet there's probably Muslims who show true, well, <laughs> the Christian would never say it's true, but will show love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Yet do they inherit the kingdom of heaven? I think Paul Washer would say, no, they're Muslim. So this whole idea of, of who are the true Christians, you'll know them by their fruits. It's like, yeah, kind of, I guess. But other religions, unless, you're, unless the Christian is willing to say that only true Christians show true love, true joy, true peace, patience, kindness, goodness. You know, and I ask this question of, of, um, of apologists and pastors often. I'll ask them like very practical questions. Like, why exactly should I become a Christian? Will it help me be a, um, a better husband, a better father? And a lot of uh, the pastors, apologists have asked this, they, they're really hesitant to answer that. But I think they, the ones who, who do say, yes, if you're, if you're a Christian, you're, the love you would show to others would actually be better than the love a non-Christian would show. And I want them to say that because I want people to hear it. And it does not sit well with a lot of people. Some people don't care at all. Oh, yeah, Christian is best at everything. We're the bestest at loving. We're the bestest at joining. We're at the bestest at, at uh, caring for others. Um, yeah, we're the best at, at all those things. But for a lot of other Christians listening to that, they go, no, but I have a good friend. I have a friend, and, and, and she's not a Christian. And I tell you, she's the most loving person I know. By the fruits of their spirit, you'll know them. Yes. Did you read that passage? Study it. Not everyone who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, not everyone who professes, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. There are many people who are going to profess, Lord, Lord, but they are not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. My dear, precious child, are you one of them? Lord, Lord. Now, again, let's go back to Hebrew literature. He said, Lord. Yes, Chen, a good question uh, I like to ask Christians in general is who goes to heaven? That is not an easy question for most Christians to answer. By the way, I'll give the answer. Um, from the Christian doctrine, the best answer to who goes to heaven is whoever God wants to go to heaven, whoever God desires to go to heaven. Um, any other answer, you can so easily poke holes in it. Because you can't say, well, those who have confessed with Jesus Christ uh, with their hearts, that they, uh, with their mouth, that uh, Jesus Christ is Lord. You can't give that as an answer unless you're willing to condemn all the babies and all the mutes in the world. <laughs> all the vegetable humans born with you know severe disabilities if you're going to condemn them to hell so you got to always put an exception clause so the question of who goes to heaven in christianity is tremendously difficult to answer other than saying oh whoever god wants but that doesn't that's not very satisfying especially for non-calvinists for calvinists they kind of like that yeah whoever whoever god wants yeah but for the mo most Christians, no, that's, we got to know. We got to have like uh, A, B, and C. Lord, Lord, he didn't say Lord. He said Lord, Lord. What does that mean? This fellow who's making this profession, he is not someone who just all of a sudden decided it's judgment and I better profess him to be Lord. This is a person who emphatically declares to other people that Jesus Christ is Lord. He walks around saying Lord. He dances up in front while the musicians are playing saying Lord. He sings the songs Lord. But Jesus said to him, depart from me, I never knew you. Do you know, Billy Graham is one of the kindest, lovingest men. Yeah, Billy Graham. Oh, I remember this part. This is interesting. Billy Graham. He said he believed that a great majority of people who attend Bible-believing churches are lost. He said that he would be happy if even 5% of all the people who made professions of faith in his campaigns were even saved. Yeah, he'd be happy. Billy Graham would be happy if 5% of the people who walk in front, you know, what's that song that he always played as people came down the aisle? Um, you know, it's just 5%. <laughs> It's almost like throwing people against the wall and seeing what percentage of them will stick. If 5% of, of those people who make altar calls come to Jesus, oh, that's pretty good. When I'm in Nigeria, I was there last year visiting a mother whose, whose son was in our church and was martyred by the Muslims. In northern Nigeria, when someone professes faith in Jesus Christ, you pretty much know it's, it's true. Why? They can die because of that profession. But in America, oh, consider... Paul Washer just gave the answer of how you know who a Christian is. Listen. It's true. Why? They can die because of that profession. But in America? 
Oh, consider the cost. Think, examine your life in light of Scripture. Do you? Yeah, so let's forget about the fruits business because, you know, by the fruits you shall know them. No, you can't. How about persecution? It seems like Paul Washer is suggesting that uh, um, Christians in heavily persecuted countries, yeah, you know they're real Christians because they're willing to die. So Christians listening, what you should be doing is every day you should pray that you'll be persecuted more so you can be sure that you're going to heaven. And you know what? Some Christians actually do pray that. Some Christians, you know, have you seen the persecution complex a lot of Christians have? They want to be persecuted. So they, for the exact same reason Paul Washer is alluding to here, so they can be confident that they're going to heaven because they are terrified of not. Know the Lord. Do you know the Lord? Because not everyone who says to him, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But what does it say here? Look what it says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What is the sign that someone has become a genuine Christian? I wish that we would start teaching this again. What happened to our theology? What happened to our doctrine? What happened to our teaching? It went right out the window. No one wants to study doctrine anymore. They just want to listen to songs and read the back of Christian t-shirts. What happened to truth? Truth tells you this. The evidence, the way that you can have assurance that you are genuinely a born-again Christian is yes. that you do as a style of life the will of the Father. Whoa, he even said the word do there. Is that you do as a style of life the will of the Father. You do the will of the Father. That's an action word. That's a verb. This is just like, it's so scrumptious to hear the tensions within Christianity. It's like, we're saved. The Christian is saved by grace. But how do you know you're saved by grace? When you do something. <laughs> You say, oh, you're talking about works. No, I'm not. I'm talking oh. about evidence of faith. And it goes like this. Yeah, he, 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 Paul Washer knew exactly what people like me are thinking. And he's right away, you know, putting the defenses against it. No, this not works, not works, not works. Even though I'm saying do, repent, repent, do, do, turn, have fruits. Your profession of faith is no proof that you're born again because everybody in this whole country professes faith in Jesus Christ. Barner tells us that 65 to 70 percent of all Americans are saved. Born again Christians. <laughs> Most godless country on the face of the earth. Whoa, Christianity, the uh, United States is the most godless country on the face. Did he just say that? Barner tells us that 65 to 70 percent of all Americans are saved. Born again Christians. Most godless country on the face of the earth. Kill hmm, I think a lot of Christians would maybe go for China, but... 4,000 babies a day, a day, but bless God, 70 percent of us are born again. How do you know that that faith you have is not false? A style of life that is concerned about doing the will of the Father? That a style of life. That, that again, is, works. That's actions. That's living. Practices the will of the Father. And we Practices. That's a verb. You disobey the will of the Father, the Holy Spirit. Obedience is an action. It comes and reprimands you, either personally, through the written word of God, through a brother or sister. Paul Washer, you don't believe in salvation by grace. You believe in salvation by works. No, Doug, no, I don't. <laughs> But you just admitted that you can't even know you're saved unless you live a style and you live a certain way that demonstrates that you've taken up your cross, that you're following Jesus, you're not repenting just once, but every time. Works, 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 actions, 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 do, do, do. A lot of verbs here. In Christ and God puts you back on the path again. If you're a genuine Christian, you cannot escape him. Let me give you an example. If I was your pastor, and you were, let's say, 14 years old, and I came back from preaching at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I saw you standing out there in a... Patrick, I, I hear what you're saying. What's the problem with God's grace in your life being shown by what you do? But what Paul Wash is saying is just the reverse. It's, it's you don't know you're saved unless you do certain things. So in order to be saved, you should be doing these things. This is what I'm saying about the works part. Now, if you're not doing those things, like let's take an extreme example. This, um, all those who, let me bring up that list. Patrick, you're bringing up some good questions here. So let's... Uh, all those who live like this shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Let's see if I can find that here. 
yeah, First Corinthians six nine. Uh, Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves. Okay, let's just pick thieves. Let's say you live a life of thievery. Not just once in a while. Every day you wake up in the morning and you steal. Question. Will you inherit the kingdom of heaven? According to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, the answer is no. Now, question, are you saved by grace or by what you do? Thievery, stealing, is something you do. Is There's definitely actions you can do that can keep you out of heaven, according to this. But yet, on the same hand, the Christian wants to say, but there's nothing you can do to get to heaven. There's nothing you can do to get to heaven, but there's definitely something you can do to not get to heaven. You see the problem there, Patrick? This is what I'm kind of, I hear what you're saying, but there's this like fine balance. It's like a dance that Christians have to do to have salvation be grace and yet have this demonstration of this grace through works and have it all fit together and not go nuts. Okay. <laughs> Sorry park or on a corner with a bunch of hoodlums doing things you shouldn't be doing. You are a member of our church. I would tell you, get in the car. I would take you home to your father. I wouldn't be mad at you. I'd be mad at your father. I would tell him, sir, you are a derelict father, that you would allow your child to be out in such circumstances. I want you to know something. God is not a derelict father. If you can play around in sin, if you can love the world and love the things of the world, if you can always be involved in the world and doing things of the world, if your heroes are worldly people, if you want to look like them and act like them, if you practice the same things they practice, oh, my dear friend, listen to my voice. There's a good chance you know not God and you do not belong to him. Yep. Uh, so my encouragement to Christians listening is if you look just like and act like and talk like your non-Christian friends, you're probably going to hell. Now, bring this to close. Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. You say the most important thing on the face of the earth is to know Jesus Christ. That is not true. The most important thing on the face of the earth is that Jesus Christ knows you. If, I'm not going to get into the White House tomorrow because I walk up to the gate and tell everybody I know George Bush. But they will let me in if George Bush comes out and says, I know Paul Washer. You can profess to know Jesus, but my question for you, do you know Jesus? Does Jesus know you? And look how he describes the lost man here. He says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. In Greek, anomia. A negative particle, ah, not word namas, law, no law. And this is what it means. Let me give you an accurate translation of this. Depart from me. Listen to me. If I could come out there and hug you while I was telling you this, I would. Listen to me. He says, depart from me, those of you who claim to be my disciples, who confessed me as Lord, and yet you live as though I never gave you a law to obey. I just described the great majority of North American Christianity. If anyone starts talking about law, if anyone starts talking about biblical principles on what we're supposed to do and not supposed to do, how we're to live and not supposed to live, everyone starts screaming legalists. Legalists. But Jesus said, depart from me, those of you who lived, you called me Lord, but you lived as though I had never given a law. In American Christianity today, pass through the gate, praise God, live like the rest of the world and it's okay, you're just carnal, maybe one day you'll come back. Do you know what happens because of our bad evangelism? We have gazillions of children saved in vacation Bible school. When they hit 15 years old, they enter into the world and live like demons, a great majority of them. And then when they're around 30, they come back and rededicate their life. Maybe they just got saved. Because, folks, it's more than just telling someone you're saved because... Yes, he's describing, I think, what op often happens. <clears throat> In fact, if, <laughs> if the Christian knew for certain that they would die at the age of 70, why in the world would you uh, <laughs> become a Christian at the age of 18? when you can become a Christian, when your hormones settle down a little bit in your 30s or 40s. See, Christianity, um, well, the Christian's going to answer, well, because you're disappointing God. You're, you're not obeying God. Why? This is a, another great question to ask Christians. Why is disobedience wrong? Why is disobeying God wrong? 
And really when it comes down to it, it's just by definition, because the standard of right and wrong is based on this God. And so just by definition, uh, disobeying God is wrong. But when you think about disobedience in terms of harm, it becomes really interesting. What would you rather do, disobey God or save a life? Now, I, I can hear Christians saying that's an unfair hypothetical, but I really don't think so. I think you can imagine a situation where you're purposely disobeying Yahweh. Oh, here's an example. The Canaanites. Yahweh says, I want you to kill the Canaanite women and children. And you're an Israelite man you know, in the army. You say, no, God, not going to do it. Why is that bad for that man to disobey God? So what if God commanded it? He saved the life of the Canaanite children? Well, Doug, God knows best. Maybe. But isn't bringing joy, peace, love, happiness better than obeying God? <laughs> See, but for the Christian mind, it's like, there would be no love without God. There would be no peace. He's the source of all these great things. But this, there, there are situations in the Bible where obeying God causes harm, causes division, causes bloodshed. So what's better? Why is obeying God better in that case? And I think the answer that they have to give is fear God. He can smite you. You better obey him. Don't you realize he's the creator of the universe and he can hurt you? Don't you dare even consider the thought of disobeying God. Who are you? You're just a human being. You acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Satan acknowledges that Jesus is Lord. He is your life in a process of change. And then he drops down, he talks about two people, two foundations. Do you know what this passage in contemporary... See, it's important to study theology and it's important to study history. The contemporary interpretation of this passage about the rock and the sand is basically like this. If you're a Christian, you need to build your life upon the rock. Because if you build your life upon the sand, you'll be an unhappy Christian and your life won't go right. That is not what Jesus is teaching and history backs me up on it. It was hardly ever interpreted that way. You know what the interpretation is? It goes like this. There are two ways. There's a narrow way and a broad way. Which one are you on? There are two types of trees. There is a good tree that bears good fruit and it's going to heaven. There's a bad tree and you know it's bad because it bears bad fruit and it's going to hell. It's going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. There are those who profess Jesus as Lord and they do the will of the Father who is in heaven. And there are those who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and they do not do the will of the Father who is in heaven and they go to hell. Not because of a lack of works, but because of a lack of faith demonstrated by the fact that they had no works. And then he goes on. This is not two Christians building their house on two different foundations. No, this again is a saved man and a lost man. The lost man hears the word of God preached, but he lays no foundation. You cannot see in any way in his life how the word of God is forming and building and sustaining his life. His life is not... How many people in the Southern Baptist Convention, regardless of all our numbers, regardless of everything we say, if we were to simply take this passage and compare the people to this passage and say, are you building your marriage on the Word of God? Are you raising your children on the Word of God? Are you doing your finances on the Word of God? Are you living, separating yourself from the things of this world based upon the Word of God? How many would be able to answer positively? Yeah, you know, and there's things... Um, I, I can imagine a family building their, their marriage on the Word of God and still not being Christian, still having this great fruit, great love, peace, joy. They're still going to hell. What's the difference? They just haven't accepted the gift? Or I think in Paul Washer's um, theology, it's God hasn't regenerated them. No, none of that. I profess Jesus. He's my Savior. My Sunday school teacher told me so. Oh, I know, like Leonard Ravenhill, an acquaintance of mine, before he passed on, he used to say, I preach in a lot of Baptist churches once. I preach in a lot of places like this once. I could have got up here today with a vocabulary that would have astounded you and preached you things that would have lifted you up and floated you around this room. I could have told you stories that would have made you laugh and stories about dogs and grandmas that would have made you cry. But I love you too much for that. I know, I know because the word of God is true that there are people who believe themselves to be saved and they're no more saved than not. I know that there are some of you who look around and you think, well, I'm saved. I mean, look, I look like everybody else in my youth group. What makes you think your youth group is saved? Well, I'm Whoa. Whoa, that's pretty. He's basically saying, you could have a whole youth group doomed for hell. 
like my parents or unlike the adults in my church or the deacon or the pastor, what does that matter? You won't be judged by them on the day of His coming. My question for you, beloved, my question for you, little child, I mean, you could be my children. And I pro How is this not psychological bullying? How is this not mental torture in a way? Like, if I was a father and my 12-year-old son is in there right now, feeling such tremendous amounts of guilt, that would not sit well with me. Like, it's a... I, I don't know how to say this and be forceful enough. I'll, I'm going to say this as forcefully as I can. I am gladly willing to go to hell if this version of Christianity is true. I am willing to go to hell if this version of Christianity is true. This version of Christianity is sick to its core. But yet people desire it. It, it boggles my mind. It's that sense of, of being special that God saved me and I can't do anything without him. And, but this is sickness. The level of guilt that this guy is heaping on the young people. The fear that he's, you're not saved, you're going to hell. But yet at the same time, I want people to hear it. It's like I'm, I don't, I wouldn't want my kids to experience this, but I want people to hear this so they can hear like in the safety of their privacy of their own home, the sickness and say, I don't want any part of this. He says something really interesting about his own son coming up. I, I think I want to play that. Pray someday when my little boy grows that there'll be a preacher who'll stand before him and say, I'm not for this. Let's get down. What does the Word of God say? How does your life stand in front of that blazing fire which is the holiness of God on that final day, beloved, precious little girl, beloved, precious young man, on that final day, will your confession hold true? Are you saved? Yeah, you can just see the angst in him, the anguish. And I tell you, there's most of those Christians who are scared to use the word hell, this is what they're thinking and feeling, especially when it comes to their own family and friends. It's like, no, don't listen to those atheists. Don't listen to Pine Creek Channel. Don't go on the Pine Creek Channel's YouTube a channel and listen to what Pine Creek says because you might end up in hell on Judgment Day. Do you want to stand in front of God and and have him look at you and with eyes of disappointment? The God, the creator of the universe, is disappointed in you. And I'm not talking about, well, I think I'm saved. You know, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but it leads unto death. Well, I feel in my heart of my heart that I'm saved. Well, let me ask you a question. Did you ever read that the heart is deceitfully wicked? Who can know it? Shouldn't you go to the testimony of Scripture? Well, I know I'm saved because my mom, my dad, my pastor, everybody else told me I was saved. Well, I'm telling you this. What does the Word of God tell you? We talk so much about being radical Christians. Radical Christians are not people who jump at concerts. Radical Christians are not people who wear Christian t-shirts. Radical Christians are those who bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Radical Christians are those who reverence and honor their parents, even when they feel like their parents are wrong. Radical Christians are those who do not, now listen to me, this is going to make you mad. Who do, and I'm talking to boys and girls, radical Christians are those who do not dress sensually in order to show off their bodies. If your clothing is a frame for your face, God is pleased with your clothing. If your clothing is a frame for your body, it's sensual and God hates what you're doing. Everybody wants to talk about a prophet, but no one wants to listen to him. God hates if you dress sensually. I'm talking about Christianity. I have spent my life in jungles. I have spent my life freezing in the Andes Mountains. I have seen people die. A little boy, Andrew Maman, the Muslim shot him five times through the stomach and left him on a sidewalk simply because he cried out, I am so afraid, but I can not deny Jesus Christ. Please don't kill me, but I will not deny him. And he died in a pool of... Patrick is asking, how do you get uh, Don't Listen to Pine Creek out of that? Um, because my point is that there's so much at stake for a guy like Paul Washer. You can just hear him. You can hear the angst and the, the feelings of, I don't want people to go to hell. I don't want these young people to go to hell. Separate yourself from the world. Be radical. Don't do what the world does. And so if the world is listening to guys like me, then don't listen to guys like me. If the world is listening to certain music or dressed in a certain way, don't do that. 
And if anything causes you to doubt, to slip up, to get off the path, avoid that. Avoid those things that might tempt you to get off the path. This is what I'm hearing Paul Washer say. And why is he saying this? Because of what I titled this video. That's essentially, it's about carrots and sticks. Life is just a vapor here on planet Earth, according to Paul Washer. It's about heaven and hell. Aisha Miles, Pine Creek, please, please give us your social media info before the end of the show again. Thanks. Yeah, it's at Pine Creek, except it's one instead of an I uh, on Twitter, and Pine Creek Doug on Facebook. Hey, thank you for the donation, Daniel Seamster. The blood, and you talk about being a radical Christian because you wear a T-shirt, because you go to a conference. I'm talking about holiness. I'm talking about godliness. I wish, do you know what a move of God would be in this place if all of you came under conviction? If I myself came under conviction of the Holy Spirit, we fell down on our faces and wept because we watched the things that God hates. Because we wear the things that God hates. Because we act like the world, look like the world, smell like the world. Because we do the very things. And we know not that we do these things because we do not know the Word of God. Because even though we claim as a denomination that the Scriptures are the infallible Word of God, basically all we get is illustration stories and quaint little novels. Oh, that God would blow on this place. That we would turn away from our sin. That we would renounce the things that are displeasing to God. And then that we would run to Him and we would relish Him and we would love Him. Oh, that God would raise up missionaries. I don't wish the same things your parents want for you. They want for you security and insurance and nice homes. Whoa, 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 whoa. He is pitting himself against the parents of the kids in this audience. Saying, your parents want this for you, but I want this. See, as I'm a parent. If I would hear this uh, Christian or not I'd be really upset don't pit my children against you against my my kids love him oh that God would raise up missionaries I don't wish the same things your parents want for you they want for you security and insurance and nice homes they want for you cars and respect I want for you the same thing I want for my son that one day he takes a banner and the banner of okay Patrick uh, I love you glad you're here I sense you're a Christian listening but listen to this part now homes. They want for you cars and respect. I want for you the same thing I want for my son. That one day he takes a banner, and the banner of Jesus Christ, and he places it on a hill where no one has ever placed a banner before. And he cries out, Jesus Christ is Lord, even if it costs my son his life. Oh, when he's 18 years old, if he says to me the same thing I said when I was a young man, I'm going into the mountains, I'm going into the jungle. And they say, you can't go there, you're insane, it's a war, you're going to die. I'm going. When that little boy puts on that backpack, I'm going to pray over him and say, go. Go and go. Kill yourself. Oh, my goodness. Mm. This reminds me of that um, incident that happened. Hey, thank you, Edgar Ekur. I, uh, you enjoy my content. I appreciate the donation, fourteen ninety nine. Thank you so much. Um, what makes him proud of his son is if his son was to go preach the gospel in a remote area that could possibly get him killed. He couldn't be more proud. What drives a man to say something like this? This also, it doesn't just affect religion. It, it occurs in um, the tribalism of, of nationalism as well. Um, it's, there's some psychological need in him, in Paul Washer, to have this idea, a feeling of there's no greater thing in the world for my son to die as a martyr for Jesus. It's, this is sick, right? Am I wrong to say this is sick? And yet I, I think there's a lot of American Christians who would say amen to this. What, Christians, why do you want to please God so much? Seriously, what, what's in it for you? Why do you want to put that flag down on and preach the gospel and make... Why do you desire... Okay, I, I'm going to just assume for the second that God's real, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm entering your worldview here. Help me understand why you need God to smile upon you so badly. Can any Christian explain that to me? Why do you want to be loved so much by God? 
Can someone explain that to me? Why do you want God to be so proud of you? Why do you think you need God so much? Do you, especially considering all your failings, and you're still a Christian, and you still fail over and over again, like, have you not figured out that God's not helping you? <clears throat> Christians, have you not figured out that the cancer strikes people, whether you're a Christian or not? Have you not figured that out yet? Why do you, why do you need God so much? Do you need him to fall asleep at night? Are you haunted by bad dreams and God kind of soothes that? Are you scared that Satan's going to hurt you and if you're not a Christian, then you're, going, he's, you're actually going to suffocate and die at night or something? Please, Christians, tell me, why do you need it so badly? You can see it in this guy's face. He's, he's willing to sacrifice his own kid for Christianity. What's going on here? Why are you so needy? Christians, why are you so needy? Man, I wish I understood it. <laughs> Which is ironic, because I was a Christian for 30 years. So I should be able to understand it. Okay, put myself back. It, I think it has. I think the answer to my questions has to do with meaning, purpose, and hope. Why get up in the morning? Those types of questions. For me, it wasn't about morality because I. Um, yeah. Those are really troublesome Christians who really think they need Jesus to be moral. <laughs> Got to stay away from those folks. Karag asks, is it possible that they fear God but fear death even more? Yeah, it's, that's a good possibility. That's about death. But still, like, seriously, Christians, are you scared of death that much? Like, show of hands, how many people here are scared of death? I'm not. I'm scared of suffering. I don't want to suffer. But, like, if I'm... If I've lived a, a long life, grandkids saw that, and I'm 95 years old, I'd rather pop a pill and just <laughs> dead than go through the whole process of decaying to death. You know what I mean? Like, who wants to die slowly from pancreatic cancer over six months? And, like, I guess some people just are desperate to live so much. <laughs> um, don't get me wrong. I love life, but... It's like when you're dead, you don't, you won't remember, you won't regret, you won't. I guess if you're a Christian, you, you know, yeah, you do remember, you do regret. Isn't the neediness a sign of low self-esteem? Yeah, that's what I'm getting at, Raphael. You're right. This is what I'm getting at. I, I'm, I, I'm basically accusing Christians right here of being, of having low self-esteem and being needy. And you know what? A lot of them will agree with me here. In fact, their own scriptures say something like that, that God chooses the lowly of the, of, um, of the world. You know, think of King David, just a kid, kills Goliath. It's always like the, the little kid, the, the weak, conquering the strong. Patrick says, to me, you just go straight to the most extreme interpretation, take things out of context, and create a hyperbole wherever you can. Well, Patrick, then I encourage you to leave. I don't like it or believe it when fellow Christians do this type of thing. Why should I like or believe it when you do? I'm asking questions here, Patrick. I'm asking you why. So l let me ask you some direct short questions. And I'm, I'm not, I'm being sincere. Patrick, why I'm trying to think which is the... F I might only get one question, so I'm trying to think of what's, what's a good question. You might be gone already. Let me ask this. Do you want to impress God, Patrick? No, let me rephrase it. I'm going to rephrase it. That's, impress sounds too bad. 
Do you want to make God proud? And if so, why? That's my question to you, Patrick. Is it the same reasons why a child would want their earthly father to be proud of them? But if you could answer that for me, Patrick, that'd be great. Okay, Raphael. Uh, 111 pine points. Okay, thank you, Patrick, for still being here. And, and I'll let you know that it's, I'm, it's always, in my opinion, it's not always. It's mostly the case that I'm always taking, no, mostly taking things out of context using hyperbole just take that as granted like we can get through this we can get just assume um th that pine creek will always do this uh, take things out of context and take the worst possible interpretation but i can still ask questions right i can still um have you answer questions yeah patrick why do you want to please god that's my question why do you desire to please God? And I'll wait for you to answer. Hopefully you don't leave. I want you to really think about it. Why do you want to please God? Don't you just love dead, dead air? The awkward uncomfortableness. If you're, this question goes to all the Christians listening, not just Patrick. Can you articulate for me why you want to please God? Okay, I, I, Patrick, I really, I don't mean to sound condescending, but you really need to focus because you just said you gave me because he's your heavenly father. I want you to imagine that every time you give an answer, I'm saying, going to reply, so what? Get down to the root. I want you to peel back that onion deeper and deeper. So you, I asked you, why do you want to please God? You say, because he's your heavenly father. And I'll say, so what? Why do you want to please your heavenly father? And then you're going to give an answer in your head. And then I'm going to say, so what? Why do you want to please because of that? Get down to the core where there's nothing left. Please tell me, what is the real real issue here why do you want why do you desire to please god what is it about his him being a heavenly father makes you want to please him colin i think knows where i'm going yes colin demskov and um yeah, answer my questions or face help. You know who the true pinesters are? The one who show fruit. But Pine Creek, Pine Creek, didn't we do miracles in your name? <laughs> I never knew you. Love. Patrick, I really love the, the, the short answer. But are you saying that you want to please your Heavenly Father because if you don't, you won't have love? Is that what you're saying, Patrick? You need to give me a little bit more. Patrick, I, okay, let's just cut to the chase if we think we know where it is going. I think you want to please your Heavenly Father because He will give you something that you can't get anywhere else. Let me say that again, Patrick. I think you desire to please your Heavenly Father. I think you desire to obey Him. I think you desire to be a Christian because you get something for it. And what you get is on earth, you're going to say things like love. That you, you really, if you weren't a Christian, you really couldn't love as, as good as, as you could. You couldn't really have this peace and this hope and this sense of fulfillment in life without being a Christian. Am I right? Patrick, so what if, G if God loves you? 
why is it important for you that your Heavenly Father loves you? We're peeling back the onion. We're getting deep. And I submit to you that the reason why you want to please and obey your Heavenly Father is because of a feeling you get inside. It makes you feel good. It gives you pleasure. It gives you things like hope, meaning, purpose, and so forth. But life is just a vapor, right? Your time here on earth, I don't know how old you are, but you're probably going to be dead in the next 30 years. <laughs> You're going to be dead in 30 years or less, Patrick. Uh, I'm probably going to be dead in 40 years or less. I actually have good genetics, 50. Um, so what? So what if God helps you be more peaceful and loving here on this planet Earth? Um, you're not going to be alive for much longer. So the real issue is that you, tell me if I'm wrong, the real issue why you want to please your Heavenly Father so you can spend eternal life with him. Is that right? I, th I think I'm right. <laughs> and this is why I titled it Carrots and Sticks, that it basically always boils down to pain and pleasure. You don't want to go to hell. You want to spend eternal life with God. And um, that's the real issue. You don't want God, you don't want your Heavenly Father to be mad at you and risk not being with him in the afterlife. Because I... What's it about, Patrick, if it's not about peace or feelings? Who cares if you want... Why do you want to please your Heavenly Father? Who cares if he loves you or you love him? Why? I was asked this about my own wife recently, uh, about a month ago. And we love people. I believe love is a choice. We choose to love our spouses. And I know this sounds harsh, but because of a, it's like a social contract. It's, it's I give my wife things, she gives me things. And... Now, that might sound incredibly selfish, but it works for a community. Um, she can do things for our family that I can't, and I can do things for our family that she can't. And when we work in unison, we can achieve goals. Okay, so Patrick said, yes, I want to spend eternal life with him. Why won't I? Why won't I? Or, I mean, why wouldn't you want to? Uh, to me, the spending... Um, living forever is a horrendous idea. I, I know I'm different, um, but Patrick, why in the world? <laughs> I just, I don't want to live forever. That's a horrible thought. Horrible thought. Crazy. Yeah, I, I just was explaining why I, um, why I wanted to please my wife because there's a give and take. So I'm asking you, what is God giving you? What is God, what has God done for you lately? Isn't that, um, oh, LaToya Jackson song? What has God done for you lately? Patrick, hang on to your chair here, but I'm going to propose to you that God has done nothing for you lately, or ever. I would say that there's Christians who have done things for you, or even non-Christians. I think people have done things for you, helped you, and you've done things for them. But Patrick, I'm here to propose to you, you God has not done one single thing for you. Your eternal relationship with him hasn't happened yet. As of today, July 2nd, 2019, I propose to you, Patrick, that your God has done nothing for you. Not one single thing. 
too harsh. <laughs> Janet Jackson, yes, not Latoya. Oh, I promised to do this. <laughs> you know, some people say that God uh, changed their life, radically changed their life. I used to be a drug, or a drug addict. I accepted Jesus in my life, and now I'm not a drug addict. Well, that story happens in Islam, Mormonism. Is it really a God doing that? Thanks, Aisha. I understand, Patrick, you believe God has done things for you, and I believe he hasn't. How would you test it? How would you know if God has done anything for you, or if it was merely a man, woman who helped you, or you helped yourself? But thanks for hanging out, guys. It's been fun. 